Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tastings Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. This is Bull Hagen. This is Berg. And this is Vicker. Uh, Peter is not with us, so if we go off the rails, too bad, Peter. Uh, you're not you here. You're here to stop us. Yeah. It's kind of like the first use of the law, right? Peter is our curb. <laughs> <laughs> right. He is our curb. So what are you guys drinking? I've got a sparkling water. I've got uh, I've got Glenn Fittich 12-year here. Nice. Man, you know, Glenn Fittich is pretty good. I really prefer the Glenn Farkless. Yeah. Or... um. Oh, what's another? Apple Hour is really good, too. They're all from kind of the same Speyside region, which is really neat. Yeah. I stayed in a place called Duff Town. What is it and, called? Uh, Glenn Farkless? Glenn Farkless. Oh, sounds like Pretty a kid's rad. name. I know, right? Like a, for a kid's book, Glenn if Farkless. If God gives us another yeah. son, I'll name him Magnus Glenn Farklessberg. Oh, Glenn Farkless sounds like a, a kid in a, in a children's book who... Uh, has a, a gas issue and uh <laughs> but so he... uh i'm drinking a uh Cesarac rye Ooh. straight rye whiskey and this was uh the Cesarac cocktail america's first cocktail so this is the base alcohol used for that so mm. oh cool so how how yeah. is your your glenn fittage you have to give her a, a an active review on the show this is how this works it's very smooth it is a little smoky. This is my first time having Glen Fittage. Um, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, wow. In fact, this okay. was a this was a gift from like three years ago, and I'm finally getting around to opening it. Um, but if, it is really good. If you like smoky, by the way, have mezcal sometime. Oh yeah, I've heard that's really smoky too. Oh yeah. Have you ever had that before, Berg? I never have. No. It's so. it's not. It's kind of like tequila, but it's it's uh I think it's smoked in ground somehow. Wow, that's awesome, man. That that is pretty cool. I uh, I really liked going to Isla and uh, drinking the different scotches there. I really liked Ardbeg because that has such a oh, yeah. distinctive, smoky, peaty taste to it. So, are they ever going to run out of dirt to burn over there? I hope not, because as long as it, I'll be like Hezekiah here. You know, it's okay if it doesn't happen in my lifetime. I don't know. It's a pretty small <laughs> island, so <laughs> it, it is. I guess we'll just have to kill more things over there, you know, and uh let it turn into the peat. So. That's right. All right, so uh this is as you're listening to the show All Saints Sunday. And uh as we're recording it, Berg is mostly done with his sermon already. I am, yeah. Look at you. Uh it's and the te- the text we're going to talk about today is from Revelation. You want to re- Read, are you we now there's an option to do there's a shortened version are we doing the full one or the shortened one I probably will do the shortened one okay ha ah. is, that, is that wrong Berg is, have you just lost respect for me hey you do you man it's you only you. it's only shaving seven verses off so <laughs> I uh I don't know I I like to jump on on preaching revelation whenever I can so well you did last Sunday too didn't you for I, I did yeah yeah. So, you, you know, know what I did for my last sermon? What'd you do? I, uh, I, uh, when I sat down to write it, okay, I said, oh, every once, every once in a while, I might like to just throw in a blessing at the beginning of a sermon. Okay. So I started yeah. writing, writing a little blessing and it just kept going. And my entire sermon wound up being a blessing. <laughs> hey, <laughs> have you ever heard a sermon like that before? Not entirely. No. <laughs> I figured once I was like, it was long enough, I thought to myself at this point, because I had all sorts of ideas I wanted to, to add to it. I thought at this point, it's just going to be two different sermons. So I'm just going to go with it. So I did. Well, you know, isn't, well, I would, I would submit that the, uh, every evangelically based sermon, that is gospel based sermon is a blessing because what is a blessing in, in Greek? Really eulogy, right? Good right. words. Right? Right. Um, we're speaking good words to people. And, I mean, every sermon then is a blessing, whether they feel it or not. So, 
Bullhagen just made it way more explicit. So, yeah, good on you, mate. Well, you know, I'm all you know me. I'm always pushing the envelope, trying something new in the sermon. That that is true. <laughs> if you can get the wrapping one down, you know. <laughs> I have done that before. Huh. Yeah, you've you've mentioned Easter, right? Yeah, Carney really liked that sermon. Well, I was half. Um, it was the same time. I was halfway through, and I kind of wrote, and I realized, hey, that kind of rhyme. Oh my nice. goodness! And so I kept. It was. He said I wrapped it. I thought more of a poem, but it just. So the last half of the, that sermon, I just rhymed it out. There Sometimes you got to rhyme it out, bro. It's true. Anyway, so, uh, we should get to uh, the text. Yeah. So, uh, Vicar, why don't you read? Because. Uh, I think Berg's sermon that he's been preparing is from the second half of the... Anyways, who who are these, right? Is what you really right. answer. So... Okay. A reading from Revelation chapter 7. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Thus far the text. So, Berg, who are those? That's kind of what uh, you're preaching on, right? Right, yeah. Who are these, right? Which is a good way to get people engaged, right? Mm -hmm. Because hopefully the people in the pews are like, I hope it's me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's grandma, right? Uh <laughs> And I think that's a good question, right? Who are these? And we're given a couple uh, different answers here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first one is, is they are those who are coming out of the Great Tribulation. Now, that word has been, ba you know, bandied about a lot because uh, of, you know, what's his name? Uh, oh, he did the famous evangelical, I think he was on Growing Pains. Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron. Right? Yeah. Um, That's way before probably, Baker's time. I know who yeah. Kirk Cameron is. Do you? <laughs> yeah. And you know, this whole uh, great tribulation, futuristic uh, persecution of the church, rapture, da-da-da-da-da. Well, tribulation just simply means affliction. And as we sang in the great um, Swedish hymn, that uh, these people have from the great affliction came, Right. That, that's what the hymn says, right? That it's talking mm -hmm. about the saints who have come out of that. Well, what does Jesus tell us about this? Well, he says, in the world you will have tribulation, affliction, distress, because that's what the word means. Literally, it means to um, press down or uh, to pressure, or um, I think other places where Jesus uses it is with the sack full of grain where, you know, it's rubbed together, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it literally means. So... Uh, but it can also mean, of course, affliction or distress. Uh, and Jesus says that we will have tribulations or afflictions in the world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul says in Acts that we will pass through many uh, tribulations or afflictions um, in order to get to the kingdom of God. And so we see this all over the place. And so I use that to talk about that the Christians in this life will necessarily suffer. They will necessarily have to bear their crosses unlike those who teach the rapture. And unfortunately, many well-meaning Christians believe this, that the church will be taken up before things get really, really bad. And in fact, I uh, have also um, 
heard a parishioner say, well, I just can't believe that God would let his church suffer. And that was just a few, that was actually like a week and a half ago. So, um, well, look but, what he allowed his son to do. So <laughs> exactly right. His only begotten son. <laughs> but I mean, what is the thinking that goes behind that? The thinking that goes behind that is that, uh, suffering is bad or that God doesn't mean suffering. Well, uh, what does God say? All things work together for the good of those uh, who love him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes suffering and crosses uh, are imposed on us, and they are actually for our good. That, that, um, that's If I can sidetrack off please. that point for, for a little bit, uh, the way that you see this and the, the world coming down against this idea is uh, end-of-life issues. Right. Where where the what what do you want to do more than anything else uh make them comfortable or sometimes over medicate them and right. uh and in some states uh act actively ending their life because uh they throw around quality of life quality of life quality of life and avoidance of any kind of suffering when um there is actually healing uh, being someone, this is a good thing to talk about for All Saints Day. Um, I think we have nine names this year, which is pretty average for us. Uh, right. Uh, and and there's something to be said about suffering, leading and helping the family when the family finds great comfort, although they miss their loved one, of knowing that they're at peace. And then there's no question uh, of uh, how it happened or anything. Everything was in God's hands. And um, and uh, as hard as the final week or two weeks can be, um, there is a healing process, and it kind of stretches out the mourning process a little bit so that there's relief when the, the child of God is called home. Right. And if you're going through stuff like that, remember Romans 8 where Paul says that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And, so and we're, would, a, and we're as, as, as God wired us in such a way that uh, when someone else suffers, we suffer with them, which also helps and leads and guides and teaches us to love. Right. If if someone doesn't do that, we have a word for them. They're called a psychopath, right? Yes. Huh. Where they have they ha they aren't aren't able to to recognize a pain of someone else. It has no effect on them. We're wired that way. We're wired for that to have an effect on us. And uh, the proper response is not avoiding suffer at all costs, but to be a blessing to each other when the suffering comes. And we live in a day where suffering and the ability to... No, I'm not saying just to purposely suffer. Right. Um, Don't go seeking your crosses because God will give you your crosses. Right. He'll give you the affliction. He'll, you know, he'll, he'll pressure you or afflict you in the way that you need it. I mean, there are some ways where you could say in a mild fashion, like fasting could be right. where where it's not you're not injuring yourself or causing bodily harm but you're taking a day to to realize how dependent you are on God which is what suffering does right but when you talk about the great tribulation I was also thinking about this when you were talking about that Berg is sometimes I wonder because of this suffering and the church will suffer um, there will be a tribulation that uh, we don't always suffer as Christians. And I wonder sometimes, does that mean we're not doing it right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. No, I mean, this is exactly right. Because, uh, you know, Peter talks about this in um, his epistle. Um, he says here in First Peter 2.20, For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And yeah, sometimes we suffer self-inflicted punishments. 
and we do things that mm-hmm. we deserve to be beaten for, <laughs> right? Because we're we're bad people, right? Um, right. And that's what Peter is saying. We shouldn't suffer that way. And the tribulation is not suffering in that sense, right? Um, the other place in the Bible where the great tribulation is talked about is in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the holy city, um, that there will be Christians who suffer terrible things there. Uh, and you can read all about that in Josephus. Uh, and it says that had God not shortened those days, no flesh would have been saved, that everyone in that city would have died. But God did did shorten those days because of the elect, because of his believers who were there. And so that tells me that there were Christians who were trapped in Jerusalem when Titus was throwing up his siege works. That tells me that there were the elect in the city of Jerusalem who couldn't get out. They couldn't escape to places like Pella or anywhere else. And that just shows that things like the rapture are are not only theologically misplaced, but it just doesn't have a good reading of Scripture at all. Um, it doesn't follow any of those kind of things. So, it, it is, I think part of that comes from the fact that, and, and the reason why I think we'll see more of a rise in this type of rapture type thinking is because when people don't understand what's going on in this world, one of their go-to th- is what I would call a biblical conspiracy type of an idea where what's going on? Well, I can tell you exactly what's going on. This is part of this that we see in Revelation or that that we see in Re- Revelation. And and this nation is what's going on in Israel right now. That's seen in this part of Revelation. See, it all makes sense uh, without actually realizing, you know, there's some things that are going to happen that you're not going to understand. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how all the enemies of the Bible are never America? <laughs> it's always like the Soviet Union or Iran, right. or China, or whoever. <laughs> right. Like, we're never the bad guys. <laughs> right. Well, who, who, who um, was it that said, uh, it was, I think it was an SNL skit, they said, Coffee Talk, uh, and they said, the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Talk about that. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing. It Not only does the rapture not make any theological sense because Scripture interprets Scripture, but if you know where it comes from, that also casts doubt on it. So it came from a young woman whose name was Margaret MacDonald. And in March or April of 1830, Margaret, after having been ill and bedridden for 18 months, claimed to have a series of visions. Okay, so all of that should just, you know, send up warning flags right away, Okay. What, what, what was uh, only... one of her visions uh, about uh, big fryers and potatoes and hamburgers? I wish. <laughs> that was the next one, right? <laughs> her name was McDonald. Uh, <laughs> yes. For those uh, who can't. She's the golden M, right? <laughs> that's like the gates of heaven opening up. Is... Saw the golden arches yeah, descending. That's right. Yep. <laughs> the epic fight but between Ronald of... and Hamburglar. <laughs> exactly. For... Th- for who controls the burger, right? <laughs> and then the mighty Amber Burger King, King arises. There we go. And then, Riding on a white horse. And then Taco Bell causes a great tribulation. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's the title, right? <laughs> so, anyway. So, I mean, if you have an addled young woman who's been bedridden for 18 months coming up with visions in a church that doesn't even believe that the human nature of Christ is sinless, hmm. that's a problem. Okay? That that should make all of this immediately suspect. Vicar, that's what we call a red flag. That's what you call it. Yeah. Okay. I call that a personal foul <laughs> over the line. So, scratch it, mark it zero, dude. We're mixing our metaphors here. So, <laughs> yeah. anyway... So that'd be the, like the first point you can preach on. The second point is is that who are these? They are those who have washed their robes. Well, what have they washed their robes in? The blood of the Lamb. 
And I think this really gets us into kind of our modern stuff about the modern state of Israel, right? Because there are a lot of well-meaning Christians who have been deceived on this. And unfortunately, this false theology is driving our political alliances. And that's a problem. Because uh, earlier in this chapter, we hear about the 144,000 Jews. Now, many will misinterpret that and say that they're literal Jews, that they are uh, physically descended from Abraham, okay? But we know from the Bible that that's not true. DNA doesn't get you into heaven. Genetics don't steal, don't seal you. Uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel, as Paul says. John the Baptist. Especially as the text similar. itself talks about how many times it talk about from the ends of the earth or all nations. Right, exactly. And so these 144,000 Jews are a perfect number, mm -hmm. right? 12 tribes, 1,000, you know, 12,000 in each tribe, right? So 144,000, mm -hmm. right? So it's a perfect, it's like a the sum total of all Christians on earth, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we see those people in heaven. So it's the same vision, just from earth to heaven, okay? We move from the church militant because every Christian is a Jew. All Christians belong to the true Israel because they believe in Jesus, who is the promised Messiah. All of us are sons of Abraham by faith. It's like that stupid little ditty you, you teach kids, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I actually used that them, not so long you. ago. Right? I mean, w well, Why? Why do we teach that song? Because we are sons of Abraham by faith. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how we are sons of Abraham. What did God tell right? Abraham? Uh, through your offspring, all nations will be blessed. Right. And Galatians 3, 7. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So I'm a Jew. Bullhagen, you're a Jew. Vicar, you're a Jew. You know Why? Because you believe in Jesus, right? We are the true Israel. And so there is no theological justification for supporting the modern state of Israel. It's not a sign of the end times. Um, if we want to support them politically because there's some sort of good ally or whatever, whatever. Uh, that's worth debating. But don't use your false theology, which contradicts the Bible. Mm-hmm the B-I-B-L-E, which you say you believe, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. That, uh, because we are the true church. We are Israel, okay? Because we have actually washed our robes in the blood of Jesus. Another Lord another Jesus. point that that makes is the fact that here you have uh, people in before in God's kingdom before the throne able to see all of that without being completely destroyed <laughs> and how are they, right. as they're described as ones who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb shows that they too were once what sinners right that they were redeemed that uh they were not people who were sinless they were not per people who were perfect they were uh broken sinners that God redeemed, covered with his blood. They wash their robes in the blood of the lamb, and they are there by virtue of the righteousness of Christ, not of their own. Right. I mean, Bullhagen, you're a German, right? Yes. Your ancestors used to worship trees hmm. and sacrifice people to one-eyed gods. I think I might be a little Polish, too. What does that mean? What did I... Oh, man, that's even worse. I worship a Pole. <laughs> <laughs> And nevertheless, guess what? God chose you. And isn't that beautiful? That no matter what our skin color is, no matter what the language is, no matter what we've done, God takes us into his kingdom and he doesn't destroy the diversities. There are white people in heaven. There are brown people in heaven. There are people who speak different languages in heaven. All of this is one great symphony. Th think, that works by, by the way, think about what how that how uh, that just slaps the face of modern thinking about Christianity. Here we have uh, a faith given by God, by the way, right? Where from the very beginning, it was for all nations. 
It was to be a blessing for all nations. That's what God promised Abraham. That's what Jesus sent his disciples to the world. Every And, and there are times where it, it specifies every language, nation, you know, ends of the earth, every people. Name a religion outside of Christianity that actually makes that emphasis. I, you know, can you, yeah. can you think of any? The only ones who try are those of rationalism and the law. So I would say the closest to come to that are deists, but that's because they're trying to ape Christianity. And they're trying to say, well, what about those people who haven't heard? Well, we'll just make a, a religion of reason. So that way they can get into heaven too, right? And, and by the way, if, if well, anyone claims well, that Mormonism is a form of Christianity, that this whole discussion would throw that out the window because right. because uh, Mormonism does not believe that. Where, well, I don't know exactly, though they believe that Africans are... They yes. used to until 1973 Okay, when they had a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like polygamy, right? right? Oh, you can become a state. Okay, let me go pray about it. <laughs> uh, I received a revelation. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what all this is. The rapture is in the same sort of nonsense that the Mormons are. Oh, God is still speaking. And guess what? He told me exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I had a revelation. It said, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> you just weren't ready for it, right? Do people use that still? My bad. I do. Do you? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, of course, the final one, who are these? They are before God, right? That this is the church triumphant. They no longer have to suffer. They no longer cry because of their sins. They no longer cry because of how terrible the world is. They no longer cry um, over over anything. God has wiped away all their tears. They're with him forever. And and that's the, that is the glory of the kingdom of God is to be with him. Right. Uh, one of uh, your favorite hymns. This is actually him that you probably like. Says, what does it say of, of uh, the kingdom of God? It would be void and bare. From Lord, I if, love thee with all my thou, heart. If Lord were, yeah. If thou Lord wert not near me, isn't that beautiful? Mm hmm. It is. It's just. It's so wonderful. God is so good to us, and we don't deserve any of it. Nobody does, and He gives it to us freely. So let's fight false theology. Let's fight the people who want to take this away from us. The ones who actually want to use this to pursue earthly temporal goals. Right. Let's not let them use it. Because theology does impact life. And if you have a false theology, well, I mean... Because every, every, you know, everyone has a theology. Everybody does. Just is it right or not? So... Uh, All right, Peter. I, I suppose you'll have a lot of editing to do, but... All you right. <laughs> well, that brings us now. We Oh, I, before we get to the top 12 list, we have an edit to make from uh, the top 12 list from Hannah. Okay. Uh, Hannah says, Dear Pod Fam, from obviously our Aww. Pod Mom, right? Thank you for so much for calling me last week when it wasn't even my birthday or Mother's Day. <laughs> Do we know when her birthday is? I just is? took the initiative on that one. <laughs> Maybe next I, time. I don't. I'll be able to hear more than one-fourth of you. What do you mean? You listen to the show. You heard everything we said. <laughs> Anyways. Um, uh, I did intend for the top 12 to be read load too high. For why would the vicar care that this Hannah person likes cookies if he didn't know she was the podcast mom? But all's well that ends well. And now you have that episode to add to your required listening list for future updates. Um, Boom. And now for some corrections and clarifications. Uh, regarding pancake syrup, you discussed sending me some and never did. When I visited, the pancake syrup could not be found. Hmm. Mm. Whoops. It's kind of like Q, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was a spiritual. It we was know a, it, was it was there. A spiritual one. It was just here a second ago. I can't seem to find it. 
<laughs> All right. Those golden plates, I need those magic spectacles. <laughs> um regarding uh uh Chris uh Krista Hoosel, she calls him. <laughs> him and anything related to him, save Jesus, I barely tolerate. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh so uh Pastor Chris Christian, if you uh are listening Perhaps you can do a dedication of a show to Hannah, which would be amazing. Well, I would say, Pastor Chris Christian, if you're listening, just you got to be more winsome because it's all about Jesus. Right. That's right. So if you happen to be at the right exit over by Port Berlin, Oklahoma, uh, let them know. Um, number one. Oh, wait. Here I'm. Regarding baby flip-flop, he also ache. He also AKAs as Abel. Vicar, why would that be? As Abel? I don't remember why he was called Flip Flop. Uh, regarding the first one, uh, her number one, uh, besides being a podcast mom, I am an actual mom of now three kiddos. Miss Five, the rummager in chief, and baby Flip Flop. Also known. Uh, is it because he's a twin? No. I'm I, I'm surprised you don't know because I have no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> I have no idea. Berg, save us. Well, it could be because uh, Abel or Havel means, you know, breath or fruitless. And Oh, that's right. Yeah. She might have thought that, you know, she might have had such high hopes for the others. And, uh, you know. So it's kind of a Cain and Abel type situation. Right. Gosh. It could be a Cain and Abel situation. Got it. So my son knows who Abel is. He'll always say brother for Cain, but he will never say Cain. He'll always say Abel. Well, wow. he'll always point out he'll always point out Abel in uh, the woodcut picture books we got called the Story of Salvation from the Protestants. So it's hmm. awesome. Uh, th- would that so. make you an 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 abler an, <laughs> an abler? <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Yes. All right. Yes, it would. Okay. Regarding. Ice and water. I appreciate cool water, so sometimes I add a cube or two. That's a lot of work. But the <laughs> but the three inches of ice most res- restaurants add to a water glass makes me too cold all over. Mm. So, actually, I've heard yeah, that like drinking ice, ice water up. helps you lose weight because you actually burn calories to warm that cold water back up again. Yeah, I'm convinced that drinking things that are way too cold is just not good for you. So... I try to stay away from doing that. What do you base well, this on? What happens if you put iced water on the outside of you? I, I don't think be good for you. Is it? Well, yeah, I guess it's supposed to be good for like the respiratory system or whatever. Yeah, Joe Rogan does it. It's got to be good for you. Look at Joe Rogan Boom. and tell me that he's a healthy man. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna start. Okay, Vicar, I promise you this. I am gonna start doing ice baths. Okay, report to All me right. your findings. Okay, I will. <laughs> So anyway, thank you, Hannah. Also for the uh, uh, Facebook post, um, I sent her a hymn, uh, the post-baptism Thanksgiving hymn, Nun Gott lob, es ist vollbracht und der Bund mit Gott beschlossen, which was translated by Matthew Carver. It's a beautiful hymn. Um, you can, we should actually, Peter, I'll send you the, the deal and then we can... Uh, Maybe post that on our Facebook page here. So, well, it's a great little hymn. And so she posted uh, the last stanza here was, "Grow in strength and godliness, and increase thy parents' gladness. May what thou dost now possess comfort thee in every sadness. May thy baptism be the portal leading thee to life immortal." Good words. So. All right. So we have a top 12 list now that we can have finished Hannah's top 12 list and got clarification. Uh, We need to go to Berg's. All right, Peter. Play the intro. There we go. (laughs) Enough nonsense. It's time for Bullhagen's top 12. All right. So give us a, you have a title, but I remember remember correctly, the title is about a page and a half long. (laughs) Yeah, it probably is. Uh, It's Luther's top 12. 12 list for Luther's third Invocavit Sermon on Images. That's right. We went through four. We went through four, so we are on uh, number eight. Number eight. 
Again, did not Moses erect a bronze serpent, as we read in his fourth book, Numbers 22? How then can you say that Moses forbade the making of images when he himself made one? It seems to me that such a serpent is an image, too. How shall we answer that? So, uh, I mean, that one's pretty easy to talk about here, right? That, look, okay, so you hate images. Moses made a bronze serpent. Isn't that an image? He told the Israelites to look at it. So that way they wouldn't die from poisonous snake bites. So how are you going to answer that? Oh, iconoclasts. Oh, ye Puritans. And, and the fact that in referencing that in John chapter 3, Jesus uses that as an example to, t to speak of himself. So not only was that an image lifted up for them to see where how they were going to be saved, Jesus referenced references that to him as so like the Moses lifted up the serpent so must the son of man be lifted up so yeah. that itself John chapter 3 John yeah. himself uses that as an image uh Jesus does excuse me of himself look at a visual image not, not that he's saying that explicitly that we should have crosses that we should look at but kind of because he's referring to his own death on the cross and how he must be lifted up and seen, looked upon. Well, and this bronze serpent did what no cross today could do. It actually saved people from physical death. If you looked at it, you would live. But but don't you think Moses was saying that uh, uh, that you the, the bronze serpent isn't going to save you? It's really God. Ha! Huh. Right. <laughs> I think they all understood that. Right. Right. My, po my point That's, is, which is when we have certain images, I think we understand it that way. Right. And that's where like people get kind of, not to make fun of autistic people, but they get so myopic. They get, they get very, very focused in and say, well, the Bible says you can't make images, so you can't make images. Yeah, what's the point? We've talked about that earlier, right? That this is for those who worship images. Right. It's kind of like my son. When my son gets tired, he starts repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Right? You can't break him out of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, time for bed. I don't want to go and, to bed. No, he doesn't even say that. By that point, he uh, he could be talking about like Thomas the Train. Like, Thomas the Train doesn't have any tracks. Thomas the Train doesn't have any tracks. <laughs> Thomas the Train doesn't have any tracks. It's like, okay, okay. Do you want ice cream? Thomas the Train doesn't have any tracks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time to go to bed. Right? I, yeah. This is what this is. So, it's like you're you living know. with a little vicar. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's water in baptism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Fort Wayne. Ouch. Not you necessarily, but pretty much every vicar. <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> that they tell us now in uh, Theologia of Baptism that just because there's water in the story right. doesn't mean it's about baptism. So. Oh man, they're moving forward. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I think at one time I made it like every once in a while I'll make a little bit of a joke in a sermon, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the one time I got a, a decent chuckle because most of the time people are ready to be serious and it doesn't really work. But I made a, like uh, something like, "Wow, I've I've said talked about baptism as much as a vicar in this sermon or something." <laughs> Well, you know, and this is the thing is sometimes I think people like it's good to be reverent, but look at Elijah. Dude was making fun of the prophets of Baal. Right. Is your God asleep? Maybe you should cry a little bit louder. <laughs> Has he gone to the toilet? <laughs> I mean, that's funny, right? Yeah. You know, that's funny. So. All right. Moving on. Moving on. Number seven. Again, do we not read that also the two birds were erected on the mercy seat? Exodus 37, 7. The very place where God willed that he should be worshipped. And then here's the reference for Exodus 37, 7. He made two cherubim of beaten gold. He made them of one piece at the two ends of the mercy seat. Luther calls them birds because they have wings. Exodus 25, 20. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So if the mercy seat 
is in reference to Christ as we know it is from Romans, right? Mm-hmm. That Christ is the hilasterion, the mercy seat. Uh, then wouldn't it be blasphemous if images are forbidden to have, I don't know, images on the mercy seat? Yeah. With their wings kind of, you know, covering it? Isn't that an image? It, well, I don't know. Well, it's, it's kind of because that is that was uh, the tabernacle was in the temple kind of the blueprint of God's presence, so to speak. Kind of like what you had on Mount Sinai. Well, it was God's local presence. Yeah. Right. And and you had yeah. on Mount Sinai, only Moses could go on top, and the elders could only go so far. Um, just like uh, the, the holy place and the holy of holies. Um, but the temple was supposed to be a visual representation of what was really going on as best as they could. When you saw those things, those holy things, it was supposed to remind her that this is where God meets his people. And I wish we had cherubim in church. That'd be so awesome. Yeah. You don't, you don't have, don't you have uh, 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 birds with wings on the tops of your flags on your, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different kind of cherubim. <laughs> yeah. I think those are patterned out. At- Patterned after the Roman eagle. Oh. And that's like no bueno. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that gets us to the conclusion of these of these arguments in... Number six. Here we must admit that we may have images and make images, but we must not worship them. If they are worshipped, they should be put away and destroyed, just as King Hezekiah broke in pieces the bronze serpent erected by Moses. 2 Kings 18.4. So that's the conclusion of all this, right? We can have images, we can make images, but we must not worship them. If we start to worship them, then we must break them into pieces. Which, by the way, it, ama- it, it, was oh, an, it was an issue of the day. I mean, at the time of the Reformation, uh, you had certain, like, uh, a piece from the cross <laughs> or various right. things that were supposed to hold all sorts of holy-type things. Um, uh, which you're supposed to go and see for a nominal fee. Yeah, the the quote unquote holy re- relics where right. you have like a saint's finger and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Which and it, it would get to the point of a worship. Yeah. Right, <clears throat> and if you look at some of the Eastern Orthodox practices, it gets very very close to idolatry, to worship, if not over the line, right. Right. And you mark it zero, next frame, right? Pardon? <laughs> you mark it zero, <laughs> and then it's the next frame. Big Lebowski? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't remember. Oh, from Smokey, the... you're over the line. Do you get the reference? Yeah, it's the Big Lebowski. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think Kingpin was better, but... <laughs> Epic fail on your part. <laughs> <laughs> the fighting words? <laughs> All right, so... Which came first, uh, the Big Lebowski or, or Kingpin? I don't know. I, Let's I'm look not it sure. up. Uh, 1996 is Kingpin. Yeah, the Lebowski was like 98, wasn't it? Uh, 1998, yeah. Hey. So Kingpin did come first. Hmm. It was like the John the Baptist to... <laughs> the forerunner? The Messiah of bull, uh, <laughs> The forerunner of all uh, bowling movies, which is the big Lebowski. He was the Elijah to Lebowski's Elisha. Amen. <laughs> So the Big Lebowski inherited a double portion of Kingpin spirit. That's why it's more popular. Hmm. There we go. Number five. And who would be so bold as to say when he is challenged to give an answer, they will worship the images. They will say, are you the man who dares to accuse us of worshiping them? Do not believe that they will acknowledge it. To be sure it is true, but we cannot make them admit it. Just look how they acted when I condemned works without faith. They said, do you believe that we have no faith or that our works are performed without faith? Then I cannot press them any further, but must put my flute back into my pocket. For if they gain a hair's breadth, they make a hundred miles out of it. Hmm. So this comes back to the Eighth Commandment, right? If Mm -hmm. we immediately condemn somebody and say, well, you worship images, they're going to say, well, who are you to condemn us of that? And... If they don't admit it, then you're kind of stuck, right? 
Just look at how they acted when I condemned works without faith. They said, do you believe that we have no faith or that our works are performed without faith? Then I cannot press them any further, but must put my flute back into my pocket. I like that, that, you know, that phrase. Yeah. Put my flute back in my pocket, right? Uh, Which is just another way of saying like, okay, can you condemn, can you say, I'm going to judge hearts? No. No. You can't judge hearts. And if they won't admit it, then you're kind of stuck, right? Which is which is why it's a good distinction to have when you're talking about closed communion. Because Right. And that's where you go by the confession, right? Right. Well, I be- And it's kind of it's kind of the same thing here, right? Like are you saying we worship images? And I'm sure if you went to any Eastern Orthodox person, or any Roman Catholic and said, well, you worship images, they're going to say, no, we don't. Right. How dare you? Which, well, which is that then, same reaction if you tell a Catholic they worship Mary. Well, some of them right. will tell you and that they it, do. <laughs> That's true. Y- yeah. Oof, duh. Well, you know, their priests didn't teach them very well, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, As uh, right? quoted so, by uh, uh, Run DMC, the great poets, Mary, Mary, why are you bugging? <laughs> ah. But, you know... That's the thing, right, is we have to take people at their word. If they're saying they're not worshiping images, we have to say, okay, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is not a must, right? Images are not a must. No. They are optional, right? It doesn't mean that they're bad optional. I mean, I love the woodcuts. I love the crucifix. I love the stained glass Mm -hmm. windows. They're beautiful, but they're not a must, which, which is something that uh, I think uh, young pastors or new pastors kind of grasp or have to learn to grasp once in a while is right. many things that, uh, that uh, we try and lead a congregation are good and helpful, but uh, pushing something that they're not ready for is not. Right. Put your flute back in your pocket, Vickers. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, Vickers. <laughs> but it's true, right? That uh, our images, can they be helpful? I think so. Can they teach? I think so. So we're going to continue with the next four on the next deal. So, All right, so... Bullhagen, what do you want to do? Well, we we did this, and I think it was a kind of a popular thing when I read... A, portion of a paper from when I was uh, uh, a young seminarian pre-bulk. This was when I was oh about 6'4", about 180. I could still bench like 225 maybe at the time. But uh, Nice. So I, I think this was from a HOM 1 sermon. And uh, I know I wrote this. Do you know why, Vicar? Why is that? Because this was pre-internet. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. And uh, so I thought, what would one of the first sermons that Bullhagen wrote sound like? Are you guys dying to know? I would love to know. Uh, I want to know. So, uh, so, so to, to kind of to, uh, to tempt you with this, uh, how would I, I have, not only do I have a sermon, I have my peer critiques of these sermons. Oh, yeah. Nice. Insight. So I have uh, a critique by uh, uh, someone who is a reverend named Paul Mummy. Nice. Who said said uh, you looked at the manuscript a lot, manuscript a lot, uh, and a couple of words pronunciation were slurred. Okay. Well, I still do that. Um, uh, someone said, uh, um. Don't sway in the pulpit. I still do that, don't I? Yeah, I used to do a lot of swaying back and forth. Yeah, just finding my inner rhythm. Uh, ah. Someone said, uh, uh, get away from the manuscript. Someone said, uh, be more aggressive in your delivery. More eye contact, more emphasis on phrases that you want to get across. That's like one of the first lessons I gave this guy across the table from me. Yeah, it was. So, with all that being said, see, I think I got uh, 
maybe a B on the sermon. So do you want to hear the, the opener on this? I'm I dying do. to know. Okay. This is from uh, a, a sermon uh, based on Galatians 2 for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, the theme is justified and then by Christ's work. Hmm. So the text for today's sermon is the epistle lesson just read. Boy, boy, by the way, this isn't this like the epitome, the first sentence, isn't yeah. this the epitome of a new, the way someone writing a sermon to start a sermon? Brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I have never started a sermon that way. Okay. <laughs> what if we made some new rules here in church? What if we said that in order to be a part of our church, you'd have to have been raised here? You would have to fully understand and follow our new rules, such as eating only certain foods, wearing certain clothes. What would happen to our church? What would happen to the people who do not fit our mode? What would happen to the church's understanding of the gospel? <laughs> Are you convicted, Berg? Did that hit you in the heart? <laughs> Super convicted. <laughs> so my first point. Well, I... Yeah, I was thinking like even the Church of Israel didn't do that because like you have the you have the Rechabites and the you know so right because anyway. this this is not talking this is not talking about the Pharisees this is talking about the Judaizers <laughs> right right so well but also this is to a, a crowd of seminarians and sometimes they can tend to be sort of like the Judaizers yeah so yeah. You, yeah. you knew your the you knew your worst. audience. <laughs> and so my first point is, uh, one way you could tell it's like the first few sermons is they're very general, right, right. So uh, the first point am I because I I have my outline in my sermon, which is funny to think that I used to do that at some point, <laughs> right? Outlines um, are amazing. Love them. Uh, uh, one, we are not justified by the law. Hmm. Is this a deductive no, sermon? Yeah, there you go. But uh, don't we meet people like this who need this preaching all the time? Yes, that's true. That's true. I mean, like, like you are not justified by the law. You go to the old folks' home, and they're like, oh, I'm useless. I'm not good for anything. I just want to die. Right. I mean, they, what here's are you a, here's your a problem. value in? Here's the problem, though, with that statement. This is probably what I would say if I if a vicar put that. If st- someone is struggling, thinking that they're justified by the law, right? Uh, by me telling them you are not justified by the law. That's if you understand them. what that says, then you're probably and you're sitting in the pew. You're probably not justified by the law, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> they no, would I, they would understand I, what I it means Christians. to be justified. No, I mean, honestly, like, I think a lot of people, well, they might not understand what the word justified means, but if you break it down, like, yeah, I can understand your point that you want it to be more simple, right? Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if it, if, it, if it was for people who really needed the simplified version of that, like, because they think... You that- are not useful because of the law. You are not useful or uh, worthy or worth something because of what you do. Right. Right? So I have here, we are not justified by the law. But Peter's actions showed something different. Uh, This resembles Peter's actions. I'm not sure what I mean there. Our text says, when Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him face to face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came, came from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Peter withdrew himself from the Gentile Christians because of who they were, Gentiles who did not follow Jewish law. According to Peter's Jewish roots, it was against the law to eat with uncircumcised Gentiles without considering Jewish food laws and he had some pressure from Jewish Christians who are still strongly tied with that tradition. Any comments? You bored? <laughs> Do you end up reading your whole 
Like the whole text in the sermon? Uh, I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, by the way, feel free, Berg, to jump in and make fun of me anytime. The problem oh. is... I'm a good friend. Okay. The problem is that Peter did not separate himself from people who are going to persecute him persecute him or people who are insincere about their faith he separated himself from fellow brothers and sisters who believe in the same jesus christ that called peter from the boat to be a fisher of men the same christ who performed miracles with peter as a witness the same christ whom peter saw hanging on a tree and saw him alive again the christians well, in antioch believed in the same so peter didn't actually see him hanging on a tree but R- right okay. He saw he saw an image of it. <laughs> it came to him in a vision. <laughs> the Christians Sorry. in Antioch believed in the same Christ for whom Peter died, and yet Peter separated himself because Jewish laws that Jesus came because of, I think I'm supposed to say, Jewish laws that Jesus came to abolish. So what do you think? Oh, well, that was a little better. I like that paragraph a little more. It kind of shows... Yeah. I, you know, and I think it's hard, like when you grow up in a particular culture that you cling to so much because of the outside forces that are trying to force you to be this or that Greek or whatever. Right. So the next part of the sermon is, of course, I've expressed the problem with what Peter was doing. What's the next step, Vicar? Uh, you're going to resolve that, right? No. Next part B, we do. Oh, you've got a part the B. Same, gotcha. right? Because <laughs> it would do us no good, Vicar, if we just. Right, I forgot. You have to do goal mal- malady means. Right. Yeah. If Peter, an apostle, did this, how much more do we do? More do we, who are not apostles, do this? We separate ourselves, separate ourselves in the same way Peter from other Christians who have the same faith we have for things as trivial as how they dress. We alienate others who believe that Christ's death means victory over the grave for not fitting our own earthly views of how a Christian should act, such as belonging to the men's club or not volunteering at the fish fry or asking silly questions in Bible class. (laughs) You're laughing. What are you laughing at? I I actually know people who do that. (laughs) Wow. Do you really? Yeah. Uh, wow. just, I just think that, that is kind my, of funny. My, like, the sermon I wrote when I was 21 years old hit you in the heart, didn't it? No, I mean, <laughs> I, I know people that it could apply <laughs> to. That's the thing that, yeah, I just think it's funny that in this, like one of your very first sermons, it's so general and you've actually <laughs> hit something that I know about. <laughs> because they didn't volunteer for a fish fry? <laughs> uh, very similar. Not, not okay. a fish fry precisely, but uh, similar things. Is, is this how Jesus acted? Jesus hung out with tax collectors, prostitutes, and Samaritans and healed on the Sabbath, showing that his plans were more important than Jewish law. By the way, the, uh, do you know what the, uh, the, the professor uh, who was uh, Dr. Gard wrote in the margin there? He's that he said, old? <laughs> Holy buckets. <laughs> He's, uh, it says, uh, are these comparable? <laughs> 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 what, I mean, comparing? <laughs> it's a good point, right? Oh, yeah, I guess, like, not volunteering as fish fry is different than being a prostitute or tax collector <laughs> condemned to hell. <laughs> I get that. Well, I mean, you better make that tartar sauce, people. <laughs> Are you enjoying this? I'm, it's getting so much better okay. Yeah, as you go. Paul in our text sees something even more serious of this hypocrisy of mere separation and alienation, serious enough to oppose him face to face. He says in verse 19 that he saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Peter was saying with his actions that the Gentile Christians remained unclean and unfit for fellowship with Jewish Christians. Faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice was not enough anymore. Peter was saying that his action, with his actions, that faith in Jesus caused him to sin by bringing him in fellowship with Gentiles 
as Christ proclaimed, go make disciples of all nations. But Paul, seeing this, says in verse 17 of our text, If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Definitely not. We say the same thing when we alienate Christians. We, in acting like Peter, also lead others astray from the gospel by our hypocrisy. Our text says, The other Jews joined him in the hypocrisy, so that in their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. How utterly sinful we are. Which I don't think I really... <laughs> the great sin of being mad at people who don't volunteer for the fish fry? I could have... <laughs> when did Man, you graduate I... seminary again? I graduated in 98. So this would have been written... So, this first first year. Okay, so let's keep that in mind when we Ni- talk about 95. All this. 95, yeah. This would have been written in 95. Um, so I, yeah, I would have been 21 at the time. So let's keep that in mind when we talk about how you would preach this different today. Right. Well, the thing is, that's, that's the thing is at that age, I was still, you know, pretty naive as far as how people thought about those things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't really have a whole lot of, right. I was pretty naive on, on how exactly, people do would alienate each other. Does that make sense? And I think that's what kind of shows here is a certain amount of... Right. Because I, I, I didn't know, uh, going back to that young man's self, is I didn't know. And I, I do think I see part of my teaching you, Vicar, in, in preaching is, is you're older than I was when I wrote this, but at the same time, there are certain things that I kind of bring out and, and say, mm-hmm. you know, do people think that way? Right, which is super helpful. Uh, I know for me, and especially just like going through homiletics, a lot of guys who go straight into seminary from like the undergraduate and have no like outside world experience with like working with other people, a lot of times it their sermons come out sounding stiff and vague and just super general and almost like straw manning the way people think about things because they don't actually understand how somebody would react to a certain situation. I think that's kind of what was going on of, of, uh, you know, that, that would be also 1995. That's true. Which is like, you know, you're still breathing in the fumes of Christendom, right? Right. I mean, we're talking like 14 years until, right? 14 years Mm -hmm. or 10 years. Yeah. Until, uh, uh, no, even longer. Yeah. About 14 years until Obama says, you know, says that uh, gay marriage is legal, right? Mm-hmm. That happens in 2008. Like, yeah, I mean, it was great when all you had to worry about is people not volunteering for the fish fry. This was uh, this was when, about the time when it was scandalous that uh, Bill Clinton instituted the don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> right. I mean, like, context here is really amazing because we actually get to look back and say, oh, man, like, you know. The, the biggest the sin I could pin on people was uh, you know, looking down on people who don't volunteer for the fish fry. <laughs> right, or how yeah. they dress or whatever. Right? right, right. Which I've never really run into those issues as much. But but then again, too, I hadn't been a pastor. That's the thing, too. I'm preaching. I don't, they didn't know what the struggles people had were. Well, so. and there are people who there are pastors who do struggle with that right people yeah. who won't volunteer people who won't use their gifts or sacrifice for the glory of god it doesn't have to be a fish fish fry but it might be being a trustee or whatever and so that all gets put on the pastor you know so or a few other people and right that's no bueno either all right I uh, smile there <laughs> The, the next, uh, like that. the next, uh, paragraph, when we separate ourselves as Peter and say that the gospel is not enough, law is needed in some way. What we are actually saying is that the law somehow justifies us. However, according to Paul in verse 16, by observing the law, no one is justified. This is why Peter was not acting in line with the gospel. 
It's a good transition paragraph right there. Right? Right? Well, uh, the, and the con- you're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Like uh, The, the, the uh, doctor guard said, expand and explain what is the, what is in, what is, the, oh, yeah. Expand and explain what is the, uh, what is the end result of sin for us. Call it what it is, sin. That's kind of a fair point. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I I think you got it. That's fine. That, I mean, this so, is a yeah. This is probably the best sermon they all heard that day. <laughs> amen. Uh, see, no one can fulfill the law. The law does not justify man. We because who oh, is that? What I? The law does not justify man. We because no human being can fulfill the law as Christ did. As St. Paul says in Galatians 3.10, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Martin Luther said, since Adam's fall into in paradise, man is corrupt and has nothing but a wicked desire to sin, and his heart cannot be favorably disposed of the law. You're singing the song, aren't you, Berg? Concupiscence. <laughs> Concupiscence. Amen. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, um, by the way, that 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 Martin Luther quote, quote brings me joy. Do you know why? Why is that? Because one, pre-internet, right? Mm-hmm. Someone at that po- time at the seminary, some group gave to every seminary first-year seminary student. What Luther said? Yep. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's right. There's, there are some pastors who went to seminary about my time and know exactly what I what I'm talking about. <laughs> that was her quote machine right there. <laughs> that was our quote machine. Nice. I did not. I don't know if I, I quoted it. Luther once. That did not come from that book. Although, the beautiful thing was, is the qu- quotes had references. Oh yeah. So you could use the quote and the. The original citation, right? Nice. There you go. This guy did it. some. Lu- this guy did it. some research. Look at this guy. So it actually looks like you read Luther. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Man, we all just suck so much. <laughs> I just. I, I don't even know how to talk. You know, it just. Now we have logos, and it's like hey, I thought that was bad. But is. remember, this is pre-internet. You guys don't yeah. know what it was like pre-internet. You said no. Clue. I know what it was like. <laughs> I'm young enough. Okay. I grew up in a in a All right. you know rural enough place. You don't know what it was like to go to the seminary without internet. That is true. I don't. <laughs> you got me beat on that. <laughs> All right. Um. So continuing then, if righteousness of the law could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. As Saint Paul says, we are justified by Christ alone. He has done all the work. How awesome it is, then, that Christ has fulfilled the law. How wonderful it is, I didn't have a thesaurus, that Christ humbled himself and took on human form, carried the full weight of the law for us on the cross, and proclaimed victory. Uh, uh, We, like Paul, are dead to the law. The condemning nature of the law has lost its condemning power. Christ, through his work, saves us, not uh, our own. And he, uh, the, the commenter, Dr. Gard, says, expand on this, proclaim Christ's act of obedience, uh, i.e. acceptance of, uh, I can't read his handwriting. Uh, and then he has, he has underlined, Christ through his work saves us, not our own. Uh, he has syntax written there. Not sure. All right. Yeah, I don't know. Made sense right. to me, so. Yeah. I could probably just be a little clearer, I think, is what he is getting at. <laughs> yeah. Act of obedience, whatever. So so how, how do you uh, think about this so far, Vicar, the sermon? Does this sound like an average seminary sermon? Well, yes, you've got the opening down. You've got the obligatory Luther quote and the obligatory bringing it back to Adam and Eve in the garden. So, uh, yeah, so far so good. I'm just waiting for the baptism to come out. All right, we'll see. All right. It was the work of Christ through the Holy Spirit that spread the gospel from 12 apostles to the entire Roman Empire in a short time, 
and has preserved the gospel in full strength and purity for the last 2,000 years here on earth, despite human pride, self-righteousness, and error, where Satan prowls around like a roaring lion. Uh, the comment is, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Ah. <laughs> Vicar, what does that say? So, uh, do this to the something it seems to revert your you from where you are going. Oh, it's a diversion. Oh, so this this to the point, it seems to divert you from where you were going. Oh, okay. So it looks like you're doing it. It was a sidetrack. Yeah. Okay. So Christ does a, continues to do all the work. It is a continual work of Christ through the Holy Spirit that has called us to a saving faith and that continues to nourish that faith through word and sacrament. His his work brought us here this morning with repentant hearts eager to hear the life-giving gospel and receive his forgiveness, just as we have learned in the small catechism and there recited recited yeah. in confirmation. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by, through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. By the way, that that is also a go-to move, right? You're, yep. running, you're running short. Quote the catechism. Quote the catechism. And then you need a little extra time. Right. Tell them where that you found it in the catechism. <laughs> and then hopefully you're not tied to the manuscript at that moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think it should all be the catechism. Just. <laughs> I mean, the large catechism was all sermons anyways. That's right. Amen. All right. It was through the work. It was th- it, it through the work of Christ. Uh, it through the work of Christ. It was, I think, I meant to say, it was through the work of Christ that brought us to the baptismal font where he sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts and forgave our sins. It is through the work of Christ that our old Adam dies and through uh, which we have been born again. Any comments? I didn't understand it all, so. (laughs) (laughs) All right. It is through the work of Christ that will bring us to the altar this morning, spelt with an E, uh, <laughs> where <laughs> we feed on, on the very life-giving body and blood that hung on the cross for our salvation. Expand on this section. Where is the resurrection? He says... Uh, Why would you have to bring in the resurrection for this? I don't know. That's just nit. That's just nitpicky. Didn't you already bring up the resurrection in here? Didn't you say that he died on the cross for your sins? Like explicitly? Yeah, but you didn't say he was raised explicitly. Oh, yeah, my bad. Is what he was thinking, you know. How special yeah. children we are to him. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we yep. are special children. That's right. <laughs> Taking the short bus to the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as we get there, that's the main thing. There's your title, Taking the Short Bus to the Kingdom of Heaven, Peter. All right. How special children we are to him that he gives us something so personal that we are honored with his presence while at the same time forgiving our countless sins. How futile it is to rely on our piddly works. How futile it is to require our fellow brothers and sisters to follow our earthly definitions of being a Christian. How comforting it is that we do not have to rely on our frail, the frailty of our own work because of the work of Christ our Lord. In today's gospel lesson, we saw Christ freely gave a woman his work of forgiveness in the presence of a Pharisee, a teacher of the law who thought that Jesus should have not let her anoint him and kiss his feet because of her sins. Her sins were many. Jesus said, just like ours are. Just as he said to her, your sins are forgiven, he says the same to us who are weak and our lives our lives and world shattered by our sins and the iron fist of the law. Your faith has saved you. It is because of God's saving forgiveness like this that urges a psalmist to write in our gradual, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. I will meditate on your wonderful works, and I will proclaim your great deed. By the way, do you know what that that is, by the way? There are probably certain requirements you have to bring up the gospel reading and the introit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, oh, Ah! (laughs) oh no, I got to add that. So you're saying you don't do that anymore. Well, sometimes if it's pertinent. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope that everyone at you know in Hampton is like, hey, Pastor Bullhagen, why don't you uh, 
Why didn't you incorporate the uh, intro into this? Right. Well, I, I actually <laughs> brought the gradual, which we don't always and do. And the gradual. gradual. Just but I don't think work. we've done the gradual since I've no. been here. <laughs> we have to get what is gradual. wrong with you? Come on. It's the Bible. Sure. It's the Bible. Come on. And it's just all these page turnings and whatnot. <laughs> hey, it's, it, he doesn't want to. The, ins- the next thing you're going to be mad at me for not volunteering at the fish fry. <laughs> He doesn't want to bind <laughs> people's consciences with our earthly hey, rituals. As long as you have the fish fry Monday, Sunday through Thursday, I'm okay. <laughs> Not on Friday. Okay. Okay. I will come and I will buy your fish. Sounds threatening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So May how you preach this, this gospel different? continue? Um, uh, you I were would... done, right? I mean... Well, I would say I would uh, I would preach it differently. Obviously, the law would be completely different. Okay, right? Go go into that. Um, I would. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Okay, Vicar, Next how would episode. you think I would preach this differently? <laughs> Poor Vicar. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, this is this is. I have I have the perfect seminary professor line okay all Say right it. all Do right it. so Do by, it. i didn't read the last sentence it's which says may this gospel continue to freely grow in our hearts in all its purity as our creator intended it to without our own sinful inclination that inhibits it and the, the what is the the response third use too long uh, 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 too much law orientation for a conclusion ah. no <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Why not just end with a gradual? <laughs> Which is the comment I got. Ah, I love it. That that actually is. We've talked about that, right? We have. It's yeah. wrong. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That how? Like, I don't know. Just read the Bible. <laughs> like, I, it's not that hard. Yeah, how is that different than the way Paul would end an epistle? You know? It's kind of like I yeah, was talking exactly. to a guy who went to uh, St. Louis, and they they argued about you know, you know, go in peace, serve the Lord, and whether that was an appropriate way to end a sermon. <laughs> it's like, come on, of course, right? Like, like that one sentence, like everyone's gonna go home like convicted of their sin because of that line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, come yeah. on. <laughs> Well, and it can make uh, it can make certain texts like incredibly hard to preach because a lot of them do end on like third use, and so if you prohibit that, then you have to do some like rearranging of the text in order to preach law gospel, right? So, well, but, and that's the thing it's it's such a terrible, simplistic model that we don't have to do, right? So I, I, I thought that that's an interesting annotation, though, right? It's just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that was that. Remember Berg? That was twenty-eight years ago. I know. It hasn't gotten any better. So, <laughs> all right. You don't. You don't want to comment on that. Come on. You know you want to. Real. Well, talk. I got. I got to be. Talk. I got to be on that. So it didn't. It didn't bother him that much. That he marked gave me a C on the sermon. Yeah, he marked you down a whole grade point. Well, was it an A sermon though? <laughs> for Hom one, probably. <laughs> yeah, for Hom one, I mean, it's not too bad. If we're talking Hom three, and you're still preaching like that, then yeah, that's that's not very good. <laughs> so, all right. Well, Peter's going to be mad that we've t- gone long, so we should probably finish this. So, th- thank you for diving into the. Uh, uh, Bull Higgins, the, first yeah, edition the of Bull Higgins works. That <laughs> is the madness that is clerical errors. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening. I'm Bull Higgins. I'm Berg. And I'm Vicar. And may the gospel continue to freely grow in our hearts in all its purity as our created intended to without our own sinful inclinations that inhibit it. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts questions, thoughts, concerns, 
You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast on Twitter at clerical heirs P for podcast or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to clerical heirs. See you next time.